So Damien Doyle, the head of athletic performance for the men's senior national football team, you're very welcome to Bulletproof Dad Podcast. How are you, sir? Yeah, good. Thanks. Thanks for having me. That was a bit of a mouthful, Damien. So <laughs> what I'm going to say is, for people who don't know the strength conditioning world or the athletic performance world that well, Damien has a job in this country that tens of thousands of people are very envious of and would love to get at. It's a type of job that if you decide to go for you're talking at least a decade of hard work, probably even more to even get remotely close to it. So Damien, I think the logical thing here is we start at the early stages when you decided you wanted to get into this area. What was the pathway that you started off with to get there? Uh, Say you're you're in you're in school doing your leaving cert or whatever. What's kind of the next step from yeah. there? Um, well, this was kind of like when 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 I supposed to decided I wanted to do this. I was definitely in school. I was probably in second or third year. I remember sitting in a canteen with one of the lads. Um, and he actually had a, it was a poster of, I think it was Liverpool at the time, going, oh, it'd be great to do that job, wouldn't it? You know, yeah. like running on the pitch, looking after the lads <laughs> or designing or doing the training or whatever. And it's like, yeah, like that's definitely the job I kind of want to do. So I did know quite early on like that I wanted to do it. So it was just a case of going full steam ahead of like, you know, trying to get there. Um, you know, where they are talking like, it's a long time ago, like 1994, 93, right. maybe that would have been like yeah. second or, th or third year in school or whatever it was. Um, so yeah, it was a long time ago and it was kind of just like, right, well, how do I get there and how do I kind of get myself to that, to that sort of position? Um, back then, you know, there was probably, there wasn't really any, there wasn't such thing as a sports science. We mm. hadn't, it hadn't really kicked off. Um, but it was, it was evolving. Fitness coaching was evolving, you know, it was kind of coming into its fore and people were being made aware of kind of the health benefits, et cetera, et cetera, of kind of where, where people needed to do or what people needed to do. So yeah, I think it was started from there. Um, and I was one of them. I was a younger one in school. I was one of the younger ones, but I also then chose not to do not to do fourth year. So I became very young in the year ahead. And then, you know, and I kind of quite quickly realized, I think there was only the, I don't think there was any courses, I think, in Ireland at the time that was doing sports science, but there was a couple in the UK. So I probably kind of focused on that a little bit and thought, right, well, I'm going to have to get myself over there to and you make the sacrifice sort of thing, get over there to study it because it's probably not going to be an yeah, opportunity yeah. here at the time. We were so. speaking off air and uh, Damon mentioned that he had a very eventful way of, of getting over to the UK. <laughs> so you might tell us that because it is a really cool way. Uh, no. So Damon was big into his sport as well. So you're quite a good GA player, yeah? Nah, yeah, all right. But yeah. you're all right. Well, you, you play for the Dublin Miners <laughs> and the day before you left for the UK, you happened to win the, the minor championship. Yeah, it was yeah. a club championship, actually. We won the club championship the day before we left. Yeah, yeah. Who so was your club? Was it Marnogs? Nave Marnog, yeah. yeah. At the time, it was Nave Marnog, yeah. Uh, we won the minor A championship on the Sunday and I ended up then being on the red eye on the Monday morning to get to the UK. Straight to, over. So. To enroll in uni, so yeah. Damien com literally completed life in Ireland at 18 no, and headed off to the UK. Not. No, it's cool, man. But like, <laughs> it's a natural progression. You're big into your sport, you're studying, you're trying to go, what do you want to do here? And I think a lot of like so many lads like myself we're all into sport and we don't really know what we want to do at that age so as you said there's not much in that at that time there's not much in that area going on it's fairly mm. unknown like would you have much kickback when you turned around to your parents for example and said look I want to go and pursue sports science like it wasn't really a real job back then so was yeah. there any was yeah. there any comments <laughs> on that or? yeah there was plenty though to be fair not necessarily for my parents but I remember it was a it was a it was a friend's dad who turned around and said to me like is that one of them wishy-washy sort of degrees where you're yeah. not gonna actually do it and at the end of yeah. it and sort of thing it was I remember just that oh, it's, that's always well it's lived me ever since probably it was probably about 16, 17, 18 when, yeah. when he probably said that to me and uh, and I was just like right I'm not going to forget that you know yeah. what I mean that's I got, I've got to make this into something now so that was kind of focused everything and then you know I finished my leaving service when I was 17 so uh, it was a case of right now I was too young to go to the UK they wouldn't accept you in at that stage so it was like even from then I ended up in just I had to find something as specific as I possibly could before to, to kind of fill the year so I ended up doing a FOSS course in, in Port Manic Leisure Centre, which was like a sports, you, yeah. Yeah, sports coaching sort of uh, uh, FOSS course. So that kind of bridged the gap and also gave me some credits going into university Excellent. as well. Yeah. So it was all kind of leading towards the one thing. So Cool. So where, whereabouts in the UK did you go to? Uh, London. So I went to London, London Metropolitan University. Right. So um, originally then, you know, I, I uh, was on the path of the sports science degree and I was doing that. And then I decided to kind of... I also noticed myself I needed to be employable at the end of this, yeah, at the end yeah. of the degree. Which is know. hard in this sector, Absolutely, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, so I decided and actually looked at the time that the sports therapy, which is kind of, um, you know, sports therapy, athletic therapy over here, it's uh, well known as, was a little bit more employable. You know, they were getting, the people doing that course were getting a bit, a bit more opportunities to get into clubs, etc. So I decided to add that on to my, um, to my education as well. So I could just kind of have, uh, a foot in both camps and you know and really did, didn't stand to you because the athletic therapy side of it and the sports therapy side of it 
the anatomical knowledge you get from stuff cool, like that yeah. is phenomenal. So, yeah. um, you know, that really added to kind of the sports science, which is obviously a little bit more kind of physiological based. So, yeah. you know, it added an awful lot more to it. And I was lucky enough that I'd had a bit of practical experience in terms of doing the, the FOSS course the year before. Yeah, so yeah, I was able to apply to that yeah, to it. Yeah, there's a lot so. to say for the practical stuff. Like, mm. So when you finished up, that was a couple of years. It was a three or four years you were, you were studying uh, Well, I ended, up, I ended up studying for just shy of five years. Okay, I think, right, yeah, so there's a lot years, involved yeah. there. So at that yeah. stage, you're heavily invested now. Yeah, well, yeah. You've got to I mean, prove your, your mate's dad wrong here. I, so. Yeah, I did kind of go off and do a bit of a... Well, I got injured then. Yeah playing over there at the same time but then I also went off and did um the, the like work experience for a period of time as yeah. well it's like you know all in football clubs etc cool. so, to so what was kind of the next step when you got the, the, the degree then what was the next step like did you get straight into a club then or, or how did you go from yeah there? yeah no while while doing the degree I was already pecking the heads off as many people as yeah. I possibly could to kind of get in and trying to build in contacts and getting to know people um, and I ended up doing my um, uh, work experience in Derby County, you know, the yeah. Premier League at the time. Club, yeah, yeah but most people won't remember. Like, I think the, the coaching staff at the time then was like, Jim Smith was there, Steve right. Brown just going on to be like first team coach at um, uh, uh, England, etc. Um, and Steve McLaren was the assistant manager. Cool, so, you yeah. know, it was a phenomenal so, yeah, kind of yeah. setup. And then I had a couple of friends who were working there, lads who I got to know uh, through studies were working there. So, I ended up doing my work experience there, and then I came away, and then uh, ended up then working part time for Crystal Palace. So I was going in there, kind of a few times a week, and just helping out. Um, good. Were they you know, championship level at the no, time? They would have been Premier League yeah. at the time, yeah, Premier League. So it was like going in there and helping out in like academy levels, and then helping out with the odd kind of first team bits and pieces, like yeah. spillovers. Yeah. Lads who weren't able to, lads who were being <laughs> kind of ostracized from the first team or whatever. So they didn't want them. to see you if they were seeing you. That no, was a yeah, bad yeah. Thing, yeah. And and again, like even if they did see us, I suppose that was when the job was the bad days. Like it was like run, 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 run. Yeah, you know, it was very different than what it is today. Yeah. So, yes, yeah, so, so that's how it started. Really, it was like kind of doing a lot of work experience, getting as much intimate, or like much under your belt as you possibly could, um, and then kind of evolving that into you know you know, jobs as you possibly, you know, whatever kind of level you could get kind of experience and into football clubs, into um, on-pitch experience and stuff like that, you know, as much as you could possibly, I was just gathering it all the time. Cool, so, so just to get a little bit more specific, because you kind of said there the phrase, run, 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 yeah. for the lads, what was the sort of work you would have done in those earlier days? Because we're talking about late 90s, early 2000s here, were you when you were with? Yeah, so, of, of I, did, I mean, yeah, like, that would have been, yeah, probably... Yeah, 1999. What, what was your title there? Like exactly, oh, strength and conditioning coach, been like or? fitness coach. Probably would have been okay. fitness coach at the time, or um, probably maybe even sports scientist. I can't remember. Okay, so probably, with yeah. that, like, is, is that mostly cardio on the pitch, doing getting them up to certain heart rate zones? Are you in the gym? Are you doing some strength and conditioning stuff, or is a combination of both? Yeah, well, I, well, actually, at the time, it was would have been at one stage. It was um, it was Crystal Palace, and I was also doing stuff for QPR. But QPR was very much on the sports therapy side, but keeping that going. Yeah. And then Crystal Palace was with the academy. It was definitely very much on the pitch. It was just. Uh, cardio based no real footballs involved yeah. it was very much so lads hated seeing you yeah say. absolutely <laughs> but it was trying to get a little bit more specificity to what they were doing yeah. so like you know rather than it being like laps of the pitch or whatever you whatever all you the know, old school stuff that went stuff, on for yeah. years yeah it was introducing them to sprints and agility mm -hmm. and SAQ sort of work and the kind of the real embryonic stages of that when I don't even think ladders were had been invented at that right. stage. Okay. But it was, uh, <laughs> yeah, it was kind of just you know introducing that side of that side of it, and the more you know, not just health related elements of fitness. It was really the sport specific elements of it, um, and trying to get away from. And it's not just about you know doing twenty minute runs or five yeah. k runs or twelve whatever, even four minute blocks. I think that was like the the new the new thing around that time. Okay, that's right. the introduction, but you know, it's getting away from uh, kind of the real old school mentality of. There's football and there's running, and we were only starting there. That had that still took years. Yeah, cool. So I suppose you were just like, um, like sinking your teeth into that literally as that transition was happening. So like, what was the, what were the buy-in like being of the players? I'm sure the underage players were probably all right, but maybe more the senior pros when you were working with them. Was that tough as a young lad, especially with the Irish accent going over to maybe some established <laughs> uh, footballers over there uh, and I trying to change things the up? The Irish but. accent helped. I think, <laughs> to be honest. Um, it was. It wasn't. It was hard. Uh, it wasn't hard to get by in. Maybe my age was probably the reason I was yeah. hard, harder to get by in. But no, it was wasn't hard to get by in from them because I think you know, a lot of them were so used to you know being run by the managers or the coaches or whatever. Sometimes it was nice to get a new voice for them first yeah. and foremost, but actually just a new perspective as well. You know, so rather than just going and doing suffering, you know, yeah. forest runs or long distance mm -hmm. runs all the time, which there's still a place for, but you know, we were actually evolving that into something else. You know, we were doing. 
you know, intermittent runs. We were doing the SAQ. It was all new stuff to them. And then bringing them into the gym where they'd had very, very little or no guidance, mm-hmm. really, I suppose. Um, but, you know, it, it was very, it, it wasn't really difficult to get them to come to, to, to buy into it. They were, they were always being watched down. At that time, it was very much kind of football clubs were very disciplinary and type places, you know, yeah, and yeah. it was very much kind of, you do what you're told. Mm-hmm. Um, and not a lot of buy-in from players. Not, no, no, it wasn't necessarily a, a great environment, but, you know, it kind of led to, they just did what they were told mm-hmm. sort of thing. So, um, no, they were good. They were, especially working in academies or whatever, they're like sponges. They're just taking up all yeah, as much yeah. information it, as they possibly Any coach I've had in here says the same thing. Anyone who's worked with kind of underage, it just, it seems to be a part, part of a career path where, Everybody loves, and I think yeah. it's only when they've left and they move on to see and they come back, they really, they really miss certain elements of it. Just working with the younger athletes like that, yeah. I said. And but it's it's like any any and you do, I suppose, you know, or any work of life, you get different types of personalities. You get lads who will yeah. be, you know, they'll if they said do ten press ups, they're going to do twelve to make yeah, sure they yeah. did the, the ten. And then you've got lads if you say to do ten, they'll do six and hope you don't notice that they didn't do <laughs> the four. So it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. Yeah, 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 it doesn't matter. It's the same. It's yeah. the same in any in any walk of life, it's and it's the same point. in a football yeah. club. You know, yeah. you'll always have the lads who are diehard, dedicated into what they want to do, yeah. and lads who are a bit like. You know, I'm not so into this and yeah, probably trying okay, to shy yeah. away from it a little bit. So as as you're kind of cutting your teeth then, so you're, you mentioned there, you mentioned Crystal Palace and Tar- Derby, so two big Premier League clubs at the time. Was there a next step from that where maybe you got heavily involved fully in senior teams then, kind of coming yeah. away from the academy? What yeah. was the next step um, from there? Yeah, basically I, uh, I got to, I was introduced to a lad called Martin Allen who um, became, was, he's, he was a... He's Martin still was, coaching now, isn't he? Yeah, yeah, yeah well, he's not whatever. at the moment, but he, yeah, he was, he was a manager for years and I worked with him for a long time. Um, I ended up getting on well with him. Was actually he was working as assistant to um, Peter Shreves, right. um, who if anyone remembers, probably definitely don't remember. Who he was a he was an old Spurs manager, but they were they were his management team in charge at Barnet, um, yeah. which wasn't a million miles away from where I was living in North London. Um, and they basically asked me to come in, and would I come in full time there? So it was a case of you know my first opportunity. They were in the Brilliant, conference, yeah. so it was a case of dropping everything and going and just you know nose diving into yeah. the to the real deep end of it um and trying to get me get myself in there that was very much in the split role and that's what it was probably the most appealing thing of it and i was lucky enough that i'd added the sports therapy side of it to my to my uh that string to my bow because they definitely couldn't have they definitely wouldn't have had both you know a sports scientist or uh, a fitness coach and the and the sports therapist they would have been just a one role so, cool cool so um, just for listeners just to, for the sports therapy side of things can you just describe what that is because obviously the fitness coach thing is quite it's fairly obvious but the yeah, sports therapy what would have been involved the, the sports there? therapy is all about injury and rehabilitation you know it's very much focused on um sports specific injuries um you know it's heavily weighted on um uh, examination and assessments and then rehabilitation techniques and you know understanding the injury process etc um there's a lot of course Courses, you know, amazing courses over here actually nowadays um, in athletic therapy, which is more or less the same thing. Um, in the UK, it was a, sorry, a sports therapist at the time. Um, and then it kind of, you know, it's it's evolved into being called different things, I think, now. But How would it differ from, say, a lot of people listen, I go, is that a physio maybe? Or is it different to a physio? Do you work alongside a physio? Or how would that look? You- um, it's it's very similar. Very similar. Physiotherapy is a little bit more kind of um, hospital-based, you know, and, you know, you work in a much broader range of uh, areas. Um, from an orthopedic point of view, I suppose, it's definitely, it's very similar. Um, very similar to, you know, if you go to, for anybody here as an outpatient or with a sports injury or whatever, you go see a physio or an, mm. an athletic therapist. So an athletic therapist, would you, would, would you be hands-on working on tissues and stuff depending on the injury or is it all exercise-based and movement-based stuff? You would yeah, do? you'd be both. Yeah, okay. very okay. much both. Yeah, yeah, so very, hands-on, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Now that was an area of, it's not an area I've I've, um, I've pursued or continued yeah. with, but it was my gateway in. It was, my it was your way of getting in, yeah, in. Yeah, 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 time, exactly, yeah. yeah. So when you went to Barn at that time, obviously there wouldn't be as big a club as the other clubs you were with, but you were the main man then. This was kind of, you were running this whole, <laughs> area Martin was the main man well yeah, yeah, so yeah obviously yeah. he was running the team but <laughs> yeah, in terms yeah. of the sports science side of things like you yeah. were you were linking in with Martin then were you yeah yeah yeah, yeah. so it was literally it was only the, at that stage staff wise there was only the three of us you know it was cool. Martin um, Adrian Whitbread who would have been the assistant manager and myself you know so, so between what, the three of us what does that relationship look like then because obviously Martin's the manager the assistant manager how are you guys communicating then and what are your kind of key roles and responsibilities there like <laughs> God, it's very different than what it is today. But uh, no, like then it's just the three of us. So it's yeah. like everything needs doing. You know, yeah. we would have had a lad who'd kind of help come in, would help him come in and help with kit and sort and bits and pieces there. But it was very much just the three of us and getting everything done. You know, everything from preparing training to, you know, the you know the the, the all the information about the lads and kind of getting the lads ready and everything else. Obviously, it all kind of fell to 
Martin in terms of and wit in terms of tactical and technical mm. stuff. And then the kind of physical elements of it were I was taken on board and doing a little bit more, but then also in, like incorporating the injured lads into sessions. So trying to help design training sessions. But, you know, we had uh, back then there was no technology. There was nothing yeah. like that that was involved. Yeah. It was very much, you know, this is football and that's fitness. And, you know, everybody, you know, I think you know, I'm sure we get on to it. But I, like, I think the biggest evolution since I was in this, or since I started in the UK was definitely the relationship between coaches and, and sports science staff or fitness staff and how it's evolved. You know, it's no longer it's no longer you do the runs and you do the football. It's yeah. it's a blended, it's yeah, a blended. Yeah, uh, yeah we're we'll definitely getting into yeah. that. I'm really looking forward to it and find but, out how it's evolved because yeah. it has massively. But no, no. So the, so the relationship between the three of us was sorry, the first word I'd use would be very tight. Like yeah. you know, you have to be. We lived in each other's pockets yeah, all the time, it, like, and it's you know just trying to run a run a, uh, a competitive or professional football club because it was full. They were full time yeah. professionals, obviously, um, and you know competing in games, conference, traveling all over the country, and trying to get all them sorts of arrangements. They had some operational staff in the background, obviously, in terms of office staff, yeah, but, and the logistics. But on, yeah. in terms of team and all the rest, I, I think you'd struggle to find a local GAA club with. Um, only three people yeah at big stage, time so. like there's a lot in there like there's, yeah. it's definitely not a standard 9 to 5 <laughs> yeah, anyway yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, no but that's that's I suppose that's probably when you look back that's early one of the most probably vital parts of your career was it getting that exposure uh, 100% yeah yeah, yeah. The, you know the stuff that like you learned, I learned from someone like Martin and Witt who you know both of them played at, at the top level and played in the Premier League and captain Premier League clubs etc learning from them was unbelievable you know and kind of the, the level of dedication the level of attention to detail you know, and, you know, we'd, Martin would often have some weird and wacky ways of getting things done, but there was always a focus and reason for him mm. doing it, you know, and um, he was, he'd, uh, he'd got called all sorts of things, but there was always a method in the madness that he did. And, you know, anything you, you could, sometimes you could you'd struggle to see it at the start, but when you got to the end point, whatever it is, you know, he'd always, he'd always have a reason behind it. Like a kind of really quick example, as we were training one day, I, uh, I think it was at MK Dons at the time where I went with him later on and we were playing in the FA Cup and there was a big thorny bush and he just went and jumped straight through the middle of it. He's like, so we're going to go through. It was like, like, what is he doing? So all the lads had to jump through the thorny yeah, bush. Yeah, like, follow, this is what yeah. you got to do to get through, to get through <laughs> this round. And we ended up like, you know, having great runs in the FA Cup. Yeah. With, but, you know, with um, Brentford, MK Dons and all the rest. So, yeah. Cool, yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah no, that's like, again, a bit mental. But, I know. think you need to be though. Like, you need, like, it, it's been speaking about like people I love speaking with here, like sports coaches, because like that, it's 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 how they get their message across to players and how you get the buy in is huge, you mm -hmm. know. And I think that's the real difference is how people have like everyone has a plan of what they want to do, but how they actually can get people to buy into the plan seems to be the ultimate kind of key characteristic of a yeah. successful coach. Yeah. Versus oh, well, well. You could literally do we could do a whole podcast on Martin and some of the like the way he used to get the lads to buy into the things that he was trying to do. Like another another one, lads were walking along this. We were trained in Hyde Park one day, which is like mm. just a bit of a day out. It was again, it was FA Cup because we always used to do something a bit different for the FA Cup. And then um, we'd go down, and there, uh, uh, it was like in the, there's a there's a lake in the middle of the of Hyde Park, and it's freezing cold. It was like I can't remember, it must have been probably November or whatever. And uh, some of the lads were talking about like jumping in the river, and it's like there are fifty quid if you jump in the river, sort of thing. And he just literally stripped off straight, straight in. in. He was like, "You say you're gonna do it, you do it." And yeah. he was just like, "Right, okay." <laughs> <laughs> That's all That's have to leading my example. Yeah, yeah. They all have to hand up the money. Or hand over the money. So, <laughs> he yeah, made yeah, sure yeah. they paid. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's cool. So that was Barnet. Then you mentioned there you, you, you transitioned from Barnet. It was MK Don's. No, so next we went Barnet, Barnet, then to Brentford. So we had a uh, same yeah. management team. Yeah, all same, together, yeah, similar man same management team. But then we added on, like you know, yeah. we went from. Uh, Barnet in the conference to Brentford, who were, um, uh, I think, second, I think when we went in, we were second bottom in, of League One. Right. So Martin kind of had the task of uh, um, of trying to keep them up. So yeah. it was like, you know, it was imperative they stay in that league. Um, you know, and it was kind of struggling at the time. The club was a little bit. So it was like, right, get in. And he just kind of ripped it all up and started again yeah. with, you know, 10 late, 10 games to go. I think they end, ended up winning six, drawing three and losing one or something. Stayed, stayed up, up so, stayed yeah. in. So but that, like, that must be really tough for you because you've got <coughs> 10 games in this huge melting pot. Like you don't, and you don't know any of these players. Like you're kind of thrown into this, trying to figure out where they're all at physically and yeah. like injury wise. There's probably yeah. a lot to like get your head around very there quickly. Is, there, there is, yeah, there is. But you're kind of you're in it. You're in it so deep. There's not a lot. There's almost not a lot you can do yeah. because the next game's coming. And then the next yeah. game's coming. So it's all about we can only prepare for that. Kind of all the long term bits and pieces have to kind of be put in the back burner. It's just about focus on the next game, next game, next game, and then periodize the lads into that. You know, it's very much like you know, see where they're at injury wise. Can we get anybody else back? 
and thankfully when we went down, we you know um, we inherited then like a, few, a couple of physios, you know, uh, uh, sports masseurs. We had a few more. There was a lot more. Uh, our team had grown essentially. Lean on, yeah. Yeah, and there was a few more um, areas of expertise to focus on. You know, even down from Martin, we ended up having a, a chief scout and stuff like that. Yeah. And the lads didn't have to go and watch as many games. They could focus yeah. a little bit more. Um, so it was definitely more. Um, it was definitely closer now to to what a real club kind of, or, you know, or a top club looks like now, you know, yeah. where you're actually kind of going, right, this is the way forward. And, and you know, as I say, Martin just kind of came in and changed everything around in terms of how we were training, when we were training, what we were training, um, you know, bringing in younger players, hungrier players, you know, all that sort yeah. of stuff just to get get the team, the results that it needed in a really short space. Uh, say if they were looking at bringing in a new player, are you involved in that conversation or assessment then? Like, obviously, it makes sense you're looking after players you have, but, like, would you be consulted and... Like, would you be made watch videos of a player to see what they're like, or can you get access to player stats? Or how yeah, that look? yeah, yeah. I think I think you're we're we're moving closer to modern day stuff now, where you definitely do and yeah. getting a bit more involved. And then back then, it would have been very much just medical pass fail and go, you know, yeah. and that would have been involved with yourself, the doctor, uh, or myself at the time, or whatever, um, physio, and then uh, we'd all make an assessment on it and pass it on. And it's basically a risk analysis, is what yeah. it would be. Um, just kind of go, look, he's got this, this and this, but, you know, depending on how much you're looking to invest in this ladder or whatever, yeah. this is probably the risk element that it is. Um, but, you know, generally it's pass or fail sort of thing. So. Like buying a used car, is it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, no, look, it's fascinating stuff. It really is. And like, we're getting to Brentford, what just kind of gives a time frame here. The reason I'm keen on the time frame is because obviously, you mentioned a couple of times this has dramatically evolved in the, in, in recent years. So we're talking what early two thousands uh, or mid two thousands to put you on the spot here. Uh, I can't remember it's a bit mid two thousands, I think okay. it was. Yeah, I'm pretty mid two thousands. Um two thousand six, seven, maybe yeah. around that time. And how, after we at Brentford for a while and then I the think we were there. three, yeah. We did yeah. three years or good to three yeah. years at Brentford, yeah. All yeah. in League One for the three yeah, years. All in League One, yeah. we ended up yeah, so we ended up keeping them up that year and then we had two years in the playoffs, which we jumped from being you know, taking them from second bottom to to I think we finished Huge leap, yeah. fourth and fifth or fifth yeah. and fourth or whatever it was in the next couple of years. So um or fourth third third and fourth, sorry. Um so you know Done absolutely brilliant. And Martin at the time was attracting a lot of enough, a lot of interest. Yeah. Um, but actually then the MK Dons thing came up and that was a that was actually a new project. They'd actually been relegated to League Two, but that was a split from was it from Wimbledon? At yeah, the time. they'd yeah. well split by then. Yeah. They they'd or they had split by then a couple of years. Um, but you know, there was a huge project going on to to develop MK Dons yeah. to a new stadium and take them on and you know kind of develop into something that was going to be That's what is the club too. now yeah yeah and which is that'd a, be quite rare like for something a project like that to appear wouldn't it that a, yeah a new football definitely, club was appearing definitely. and yeah. they'd just been relegated actually from league one to league two you know so it was a case of right could we go yeah. again and get them turned around and promote it and then kick on and kick on yeah. and see how it went so yeah the the, the facility if anyone's ever been over there the, the stadium there holds it looks a lot of, class yeah, yeah. it holds a lot of like um, internationals and under 21 yeah. England under 21 I internationals women's internationals I think internationals. there would be World Cup had games there back when it was there years um, ago I think they might have had a few I'm games sure. there not sure it was certainly yeah. part when the when um, England uh, applied for the World Cup it was a big part of the yeah. stadium so they were going to play a big part in terms of the stadium so, yeah. uh, to host a lot of games so yeah, yeah. Um, cool so that was still with Martin and the similar team but yeah, obviously yeah. you've added more people yeah um, it was your whole kind of journey in the UK with him, or was there ever time? No, no, no. We we then ended up we ended up doing one year with MK, and then we left and went to Leicester. And then yeah. that was obviously that was a much bigger change. Um, fantastic club, you know, unbelievable facilities. Yeah. Um, Leicester involved. Championship, then uh, Championship yeah. at the time, yeah, yeah. Um, then they had an you know they had everything you know everything you could ever want for us. And now it was down to the right. That was that was the point in which. Um, it was like right, I can drop all elements of kind of sports therapy and move mm. purely onto. Well, I think the title then would have been sports science, you know, um, yeah. but it was purely down onto the sports science side of it. We had the introduction of technologies and heart rate monitoring and, you know, that sort of stuff where we, where we definitely now had access to elements of being able to monitor players and monitor lads and see where they were at and put some objective numbers against your subjective periodization yeah. structure sort of thing. So you could actually start to add things on there and, and you know, you had a great, you know, huge backroom team there as well and, you know, physios and uh, therapists and uh, masseurs, etc. So you had plenty of people and plenty of facilities available to the lads, but all, not just that, the training ground itself even, you know, and where you were and how it looked and, you know, introduction of having our own chefs and having our, you know, our own canteen and being able to monitor the, the nutritional side of it a lot closer. We did have that at Brentford and we did have that at MK Dons yeah. to a certain extent, 
but you know when we went to Leicester it's just a whole different level bigger you know? level yeah. Yeah, yeah yeah skilled kind of sports chefs etc so. and how does that because now you're you've gone from being just the, the three amigos if you like yeah, at yeah, Barnet yeah. to this big setup how does that communication pathway work then like so say you're like if you're on the the sport the science side and the medical side like you're talking you're you're there yourself I'm sure there's at least one club doctor there there's probably a, there's a head physio there as well is yeah. there and is there a head nutritionist there is there some no at that time there wouldn't have been head nutritionist yeah. there wouldn't have been anything like that you would have had a, a doctor a physio you know myself um, and the coaching staff basically yeah. um, would have, would have you know, essentially that probably would have been a manager assistant manager first team coach goalkeeping coach you know, uh, myself, doctor, and the and the physio. You know, that probably yeah. would have been the kind of the, the core elements of the roles that would have been available then. And um, we probably would have had um, some specific consultants come in. You know, be a nutritionist or in whatever particular area you wanted, or you take guidance from them at whatever point you needed. But it was all down to us to kind of implement that and get it across the get it across the line with the lads. You know, yeah. um, be it a new nutritional strategy, be it whatever whatever it might be. We would go off, get the information together, and then implement it onto the lads and kind oh, of bring yeah. it across them. So certainly, from a delivery point of view, it was, and that's changed now. But you know, back then it was definitely it all came down to you. It was, you know, fitness was one very very broad bracket then. Mm. You know, it's very different elements to it now. Um, I don't even think strength and conditioning have been in, invented at that stage. Right, you know, yeah, yeah. Or it's the a few press ups when you made a bad pass. No, like. so, no, no, <laughs> I, no, absolutely. The gym and it, we, you know, we were still u- utilizing uh, gym work and uh, prehabilitation and rehabilitation work and all the rest. But the term sports, um, yeah. strength and condition, sorry, I don't think it had been invented. But it does seem like even like, like I'm a big Man United fan and you listen to former players talking about now who would have been big players maybe the late 90s, early 2000s. And it seemed like the gym was like an optional thing you did after yeah. training. Like you hear different players saying like, oh, I never lifted a weight. I never did any gym work really. And yeah. Like obviously they were fit and they did. They probably did some sort of bodyweight resistance stuff as part of training. But you know, like it's it's obviously evolved a lot, a hell of a lot now. Like you see the clips of all the, the new gyms being built in different clubs around the UK and Ireland and they're state of the art now, you know? Yeah. No, I think then it was probably the opposite. It was it was very much, you know, we get this done. You know, and yeah. the lads might shy away from it, yeah. might not put uh, apply themselves as well. It's become a little bit more individual and voluntary these days and, you know, for the right reasons as well. But you know, definitely back then it was very much like it was group efforts. You know, yeah. it was all, it was group-based training. It was like what's one, what's good for one is good for, good it was for everyone. Everyone sort of did the same sort of program. Yeah, yeah. yeah, and even then you'd have some managers who were really invested in it, who would want to be involved in it. They would want to create an atmosphere within the gym. And, yeah. you know, it was a good bit, it was a good space to kind of get that camaraderie going and get people pushed and Big pushing time, each yeah. other. So it really worked. Um, so you'd get a lot of the, you know, you, you talk about kind of performance and all the rest, you know, the, certainly the, the social and psychological element of it is is the biggest part. So, you know, it was that element, there was good space then for mm-hmm. people to be able to come in and influence the 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 lads and see, you know, kind of test their resilience, whatever you, yeah, worry, whatever yeah. you want to call it. There was lots of um, lots of that that kind of gone on back then. Yeah. Um, as you evolve, as it evolved, it changed and became a lot more specific and individual. Yeah. But back then, definitely was. There's, there's a, like, I kind of have a my biggest challenge. What I do with the lads in the gym, bulletproof that it's a small group based training program. So like that, getting guys together, working off a group program, pushing each other on. There's massive benefits there. But the reality is, most of these guys have individual needs, yeah. like former injury, the injury pat, poor movement patterns, injuries and stuff like that. And it really is a melting pot trying to bring the two together where you can give everybody the individual attention they need and the specific stuff they can do, maybe to work around stuff or do different stuff, but then also try and be part of that yeah. group culture. It, it's a hard thing to do. And I'm doing a, like my group, big, busiest group I'd have in a session would be 10 lads, you know, whereas like you're probably having 20 to 25 players in the gym at once trying to yeah. do that. I'd say it's quite <laughs> tough to manage, like, yeah. 20 to 25 personalities, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. No, <laughs> and, and 20 to 25 individuals, you're, you're dead right, you know, who are all... You know, capable of doing different things. You know, they're you know obviously working on different histories. You know, different red flags that might be coming into that mm-hmm. session. Um, but then you're trying to design something that's specific to what they need as a group um, and is sports specific at the same time. You know, when we were evolving and kind of into that pattern of getting away from just lifting, etc. Yeah. You know, it was very it was a big culture for a long time. Just who can lift the heaviest, who can lift the most, and what are they kind of yeah. deadlifting or whatever it was at the time, um, to, you know, getting a little bit more specific. Um, and and then trying to uh, trying to associate, right, well, positionally, what do they need? What are they... That's what I was just going to ask. Yeah, do you, do you, yeah. you kind of, like, say, do you look at the fullbacks versus the, the wingers or maybe the centre-half versus the striker? And is that 
performed? Yeah. Is that, does that change your your approach? Um, back then it did. Now it doesn't. Mm. Um, now it's very different. You know, in terms of the um, the back then you'd be kind of looking right. Can we can we can we influence a little bit more their physical makeup in the gym and the you know, sports specific, sports specific sorry uh, and needs. Um, you know, fullbacks obviously popping on a little bit more. Back then, obviously, center halves need to be a bit more robust and stronger, etc. So, you know, you'd be looking at that to a certain extent, and probably when you looked at the uh, the weights that they were lifting or the levels at which they were doing, it was probably a little bit. It was probably differentiated there just naturally by body type. You know? Yeah, and the yeah. natural body type lent themselves to being in one or the other, um, and and then it was you know just trying to trying to make sure that you're kind of you're nurturing them into the week that they had you know mm. so you knew that they had a game on saturday this is probably a tuesday or whatever it was you know so you're nurturing them into the week as well and you're making sure that they're capable of doing you know or we're not going there and just smashing as many big ways but, as we possibly yeah, can yeah like particularly cha- particularly championship and the lower leagues like it's literally <clears throat> it's saturday tuesday saturday tuesday isn't it so like there's a full-on amount of games like it it like i know Probably a lot of us listening here will probably have a romantic notion that these are super fit athletes, so they must be they must be doing loads in the gym. Mm. But the reality is, the number one goal you have, I suppose, is to make sure players perform on the pitch, isn't it? Like it's not it's not really about how much they can run, how much they can lift. While they're good indicators that are going to help them perform in general, it's all about how they perform on the pitch. Really, that's what like once you're, you yeah. need to win <laughs> on Sunday, you need to win on Saturday, win of course, on Tuesday. It's yeah. Everything you do. No matter what it is in the football club, it doesn't matter who you are or what you do. Everybody has a, you know, an, an equally important role at some stage. You know, be that the operational staff, the the uh, medical staff, the performance staff, the coaching staff, whatever it is, they've all got a they've all got a role to play, and it becomes the most important part of the week at whatever stage because it's only focusing on one thing, and that's getting the lads to perform uh, on match day. So you know, you, for example, recovery day, match day plus one. You know, obviously the performance medical staff, they kind of their stuff needs to take priority that day yeah. because we need to get the lads sorted and ready and right to go again to be able to train, to be able to go into the next game. So it's every the, the focus of everything is always the game. It's mm-hmm. always performance in the game. Um now obviously the individual's focus has changed depending on where that individual is, if they're returning from injury or just being in whatever it is, the individual focus will change for each player. But as a group, it always stays the same. You know, it's always about the game. In general, so when you're in the thick of it, there are two games a week, every week. If you were to put a, it's probably the fairest way to ask you this, if you were to put a percentage on it, like what percentage are you focused on recovery and what percentage are you focused on fitness slash strength in, uh, in, when you're in season? In the of it? It, uh, if you're talking about in a club environment, you'd probably work it back in terms of, the, uh, it's hard to, because it's, it's, always, it's always working on their fitness. It's yeah. always working on their recovery. And uh, I don't say that to kind of be like wishy-washy about no, it. No, it's I mean very context of, specific. Yeah, here, but like, I mean it like as in, you, when you're in when you're in football like that, you 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 don't you don't have Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. You've got match day, match day minus one, match day minus two, match day minus three, yeah. match day minus four, or and then you've also got match day plus one, match day plus two, and the characteristics of them day of them okay. days change yeah. all the time. Oh, sorry, they don't change. Sorry, the characteristics are generally quite are generally the same, but it's what you do within them days. Yeah. So. You know, match day plus one is all focused, or match day minus one is all about, you know, um, preparing for the game. Very much tactical and technically led physical elements of it are very limited, but you say the physical elements are very limited of it in terms of what you actually do, but it's of paramount importance because if you overexert yourself on that day, you're taken away from the exactly, performance. Yeah. So it's about, you know, you don't really need a fitness coach or a sports scientist or whatever your strength and conditioning coach, whatever you want to call it, on match day minus one. It's like he's not doing what, much that day, yeah. What you do to limit what, what the lads do. So you need to make sure that, you know, the 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 output of the session is structured and correct and you've got it so that we're maximizing what we can do the next day. So yeah. you know they're short they're, they're, the the sessions are short and sharp and it's just all about fine tuning, you know, kind of you know, I suppose to use a generic term, SAQ, based on speed agility and quickness based stuff, which is just about, you know, getting the lads' feet ready and getting them ready, getting them prepared, getting their sharpness, getting their eye in, and also then allowing for an awful lot of tactical and technical work to get done before getting into the game. Then you flick that onto match day plus one. You might not, you may not, you, you won't go on the grass. You know, in the modern day, you will not go on the grass, but I think it's all about the recovery day and what you're going to do to get them going get them started and get them get the pathway of recovery complement the pathway of recovery again match day plus two same sort of thing it's like right how are we going to maximize recovery because dom's last 48 hours mm. you know and this is probably where we're still at you know at this point but the idea then being that match day plus three which is probably a match day minus three or minus four at the same time so you're still thinking about 
right, plus three from the game, so we're okay to physically exert ourselves because we're three mm. days post game. But where are we now? Minus going into yeah, yeah. going into the next match. So that's how the periodization. That's what basically guides the periodization structure that yeah, you create. There's rarely more than four days between it. So you're talking like you're you know, you're you're kind of going from plus two into minus two straight back. Like it's yeah. I mean the old school. The old school when sorry, no, not old school. Sorry, the, the when you had the Saturday to Saturday. You know, you generally have your match day. You match day plus one Sunday plus two Monday, and then you know working day Tuesday. You probably have just a, a really hard kind of overload day on a Tuesday, which would be a very physically led day. I think that's what the rugby structure is similar to. I think the rugby guys can do that to do like a full contact on a Tuesday. If yeah, yeah. Weekend. And then they, and then and then you taper down from yeah. there. You know what I mean? You possibly even depend on the how overloaded you go on the Tuesday. It might have made it the next day is off, or you taper that to a match day. Uh, 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 to match day plus three plus four where you're kind of going right we can kind of overload these two and then minus two will taper, taper off minus one and then you're into the game sort of thing so you know you know um, you know how you want to train you know, and then I suppose the whole planning element of this then with the coaching staff is how much work do you need to get done and how much when do you need them how much time on the grass do you need and then it's all about planning that time and, and making sure that that time is utilised as best as it possibly can we like to work, and most people who kind of work in our uh, in our sphere now like to work in a way of we like to get our work done all in one. Do you know what I mean? So it's like when you're on the pitch and the sessions going on, okay, we we need to focus today on high speed runs and sprint exposure or whatever it might be. <clears throat> so we'll kind of sit down with the coaches, and when we're designing training sessions, we like look if we can make the dimensions of the pitch this size, yeah. if we can make this the amount of kind of square meters per player. This uh, did um, uh, kind of this, then we will know we'll get them meters in. Mm. We'll know we'll get exposure to high speed runs. We'll know we'll probably get some sprint exposure. Um, so we we'll you can kind of that's where that's where kind of the planning element of it comes. Where there's a lot in that though, isn't there? And there's a lot of communication and like it's yeah. Like is a standard day for you there? Like are you guys meeting early in the morning and kind of going okay, what's the plan today? Bring it together and yeah. you're straight on the pitch. Then straight after. No, oh, well, I mean, we're guess again, we're, we're jumping right now to modern day. But like you know, we've got um, Andrew Morrissey who works with us from Statsport, um, and he's he's in all of our camps with us. So Andrew will be able to present all this the in the Irish camps. He's now, in the yeah. Irish camps, so he'd be able to present all the all the all the information back to us in terms of statistically what the lads have done. So you know everything from all the metrics you can think of are available, but you know the ones you kind of focus this is on. from their club, sorry, or from what so this is a, this is a, this is a, this is just our training yeah, planning okay. training. So planning training, we would have a brief. This is what, and I suppose we're jumping ahead now, but we'd have had this is why we're planning training, as you asked. So we we'd complete a training session. We'd look at the numbers that we that we'd achieved. Then we'd go off that evening. We would we'd plan training for the next morning. You know, and we'd focus yeah. around what do we need to focus on. So kind of we'd sit down, look at the numbers, right, tomorrow it needs to be high speed and, and, and sprint exposure, for example. So then planning and training that evening before the next mm -hmm. day's training session would be, right, this is what we're this is what we're looking at. You know, this is the training session. We're gonna have an elongated game, you know, with you know, longer pitch, bigger dimensions than probably what would be natural occur in the um, um for whatever it is, six v six, five five, whatever it is. And now we'll complement and be able to get the meters within that session if it's if it runs the way we So expect. the key indicators are what? Are they distant heart rates? Oh, no. Player no, no, heart rates? Yeah, so, so there's loads of different things we'd look at, but, you know, kind of total distance, um, high-speed run, sprints, sprint exposure, um, uh, metabolic load, excels, D-cells. Um, I've forgotten a couple as well. Okay, yeah, cool. But they're kind of the, there. the cool. core ones that you'd look at, you know, yeah, and, what, yeah. and what you'd kind of, what you'd focus on there. And then there is heart rates as well, you know, and kind of what was the impact. So that's kind of the, that's the output. And yeah. then the impact might be the heart rate exposure, yeah. etc. And, there's so many ways now of um, of monitoring the lads. You know the uh, the GPS the introduction of that. Whatever year that came in was, you know, totally you know to blew game things changer, out of the water. Yeah. yeah, it was a game changer, I suppose. Yeah. Um, and you know, kind of got us all you know focused on the outputs of the lads. Um, we all kind of had a good exposure to heart rates and kind of the impact of it. But everybody trains differently, and you know they mm. they they're comfortable in different heart rate zones, etc. So it's very difficult to blanket that for for a group, and you can individualize. Well, just, just on that, because you mentioned there about like we were talking about the gym side of it, we were talking about the, the twenty five different personalities. Like, I'm sure it happens where like there's very talented players who produce the business on the pitch, but probably are a nightmare to probably train when you're in the gym, yeah. where they mightn't take they mightn't have the same intensity as training, like. Does that can that be frustrating as a coach? Where maybe you have guys. I'm sure. I'm sure you've come across over the years, especially in the UK, like in the club side of things. You know, there'll be players who be the star man the weekend, and they're maybe not doing it in training. 
And I'm sure there's a conversation with the coach then where you're like, this lad, he's capable of more, he's not doing it. But if he's the main man at the weekend, he's performing on the pitch then, he's, yeah. prob he's probably yeah. still getting picked, you know? Like, I'm sure that's a hard thing to yeah, balance. Yeah, it is. Like, but, but, I mean, go back to what we said earlier on, everything's focused on the game. It doesn't yeah. matter. Like, it doesn't matter. Like, everything's focused on the games. Like, you know, we have to drop our egos in terms yeah. of, like, it's not about our training sessions. It's yeah. like, you know, that's another evolution, I suppose. For a while, we went through, like, a very much a make the training session look good. And now it's about how efficient is the training session. Yeah. You know, are we getting the information across? Um, but I think we, them type of personalities, they're, they're fewer and further between when you get to the top level of okay, you know, yeah. with these lads. You know, they're so focused. There's always lads who can give more. There's always lads who can do it a little bit better. They're, you know, in every walk of life, as we said, there'll always be somebody who can do a little bit more. And the margins are so small, I suppose. It, it, it looks, or it's very, it's very obvious for people to see that. Um, but you know, when you get, would you, was, is it frustrating? Yes, it would be frustrating if they if they if they don't put it in, or you think you can get more out. And, but if they're doing it at the game and on the match day, did that take a while to accept? Like, because you said they're parking the ego, yeah, yeah, like it definitely 100%. must be hard. You know, you're putting your heart and soul into these sessions, and then yeah. maybe it's not getting the respect <laughs> you feel it deserves sometimes. Yeah, I know. Yeah, right. yeah, you're. It, it is hard to accept. It was hard to uh, accept. I suppose. Or, when you're younger, as yeah, yeah. you get a bit older. It's, it's not just a job; like you're hugely yeah. emotionally invested in yeah, this. Like you know, you are, yeah. No, I think I think once you, um, I think you know, when the session is running and whatever, we particularly these days, you know, international level, it's like sessions don't go wrong. You know, what yeah. I mean? it doesn't happen. You know, what I mean, it's just a case of it. They'll flow. Lads will do their jobs. They'll get the work put in, put into it. You know, certainly maybe a little bit more around gym and recovery stuff and stuff like that. You might get lads who are a little bit like, oh. But then, you know, we give them such a, this, you know, we tailor, we, you will tailor the kind of the recovery levels or tailor the recovery structure to some lads as well. Yeah. You know, some people, some people will react better to, you know, active recovery. Some people will be better into a cryotherapy chamber, you know, depending on what it is and what's specifically needed at the time, you know. Some lads prefer an ice bath over a cryotherapy or vice versa. So it's like, right, well, let's try and we'll accommodate that to a certain extent, you know, and depending on where we are and what facilities we have. But when we're doing our group work, we'll all do our group work together, mm. you know, and the group will drive it on. So it doesn't matter if lads aren't, you know, keen, you know, if we're doing a recovery pool session, it's, you know, it isn't always a, the best thing to be doing. Lads are tired. and <laughs> Some lads are very swimmers yeah, yeah. and others or whatever. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so like recently we were playing water polo, do you know what I mean? So yeah. it might be a case of just getting lads involved. And lads who probably wouldn't necessarily like the pill usually, are well invested because there's a bit of water. They want to win, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. They want to win. They get it. So it's about just trying to, you know, accommodate everybody. Yeah, like there's there's stuff. so many layers to really. You know, you think about like against strength and condition. Oh yeah, that's lifting weights in the gym. But just trying to give listeners an insight as to how much goes on. And I think what people often underappreciate probably is the level of recovery that's needed because you put like the intensity of games is so high and the volume of games is so high. Like we're seeing it now all the time. It seems like. UA from FIFA and stuff, the plan just seems to be keep adding more games to the yeah, schedule and you yeah. can see every single manager is saying like, this is just getting ridiculous. Like players just can't keep up with this volume. And again, like there's a fine line, I think, between performance standards and volume of games, you know, like again, if you keep trying to squeeze games out of players, the overall product of football probably suffers because the standard just can't be the same, you know. And uh, it'd be interesting to see where it goes. It doesn't seem like it's slowing down anytime soon, yeah. unfortunately, because yeah, yeah. again, listen, yeah. that's other people in, in offices in Switzerland or wherever making these decisions more so than close people. But getting back to where you're going back to the UK there, like I think you've given a really good insight into how the, the club setup works and kind of that that team and how like I suppose how you yourself evolved into the higher levels and how the team grows and you have more people to help you out and you can delegate and how that's kind of tied together. I think that the summary of the match day plus two plus one and then minus one gives people a really good kind of measure of how this is all calculated and done. I think it's a really, like it's, it's a great approach and I think it's just funny because particularly in the championship it's like you never really go above plus two or minus yeah. two really because it's I mean, so yeah. full on. I mean yeah, they generally go Saturday, Tuesday, Saturday or whatever. It might be Sunday, Wednesday, Sunday, whatever, yeah. whatever it is but you're literally going play recover play recover play and it's just like play recover match day minus one play recover match day minus one so it's and you're probably championship and back then you're probably on buses four or five hours up and down and late nights and stuff like that which yeah. have been like it wasn't yeah, really yeah, like yeah. Yeah. like it is now jumping on a, a 10 minute flight some of these clubs are doing yeah yeah no there was there wasn't any chartered flights back then yeah, was, yeah. Like, everybody in the championship was yeah. still driving you know? yeah. nowadays you know you would like you say a Tuesday night game like you're you're finished your final whistle goes is like 10 to 10 on a Tuesday and if you were barring it down in London say you were playing up I don't know or Carlisle or something yeah, yeah, like yeah. that like you know mm -hmm. like uh, you know that's, that factors into your recovery massively as well yeah you know, how of course I mean well I mean uh, Everybody knows sleep is a huge part of recovery. Yeah. You know what I mean, it's 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 probably the num one of the number one elements of recovery. But um, you know, 
you don't get it. And even nowadays, we're traveling or flying back after games or whatever. You know, it's a huge part of it. Some of the decisions you make is to do we stay this? Do we stay that night? Do yeah. we stay the night of the game? And then do we you know travel the next day? Do we? We've often done that where we'll stay the night of the game afterwards. So we get back. You now lads are there's a, there's 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 a more than one way to skin a cap, but it's like there's loads of ways we can do this, and it's really a decision is made on each individual basis. But like you know, you imagine you. you certainly in, as you say in the UK you might finish at 10 o'clock but if you're playing internationally for example you might have only kicked off at 9 o'clock because of it's, you know whatever yeah, time zone differences playing, yeah. so actually local time there could be midnight sometimes when yeah. you finish and then it's a case of you've got to get you got to get to the airport fly travel and then yeah. you know you're you're probably doing that you're going to miss night sleep but actually going back straight back to the hotel lads are so high from the game they're not going to get down to sleep or get their eyes shut till probably half four or five o'clock where you could be nearly back you in know, Dublin so yeah, you utilise that yeah, time yeah. to travel it's interesting, um, yeah. and kind of accept that they're just going to be on the plane or on the bus or whatever it is and dozing a little bit and or as opposed to going back to the hotel and just lying staring at the room staring at the walls or even having to come back and eat and get some food into them and then that you know disrupts their sleep so mm. it's all the decision making that goes around that as well because you, you know sometimes you're better off right we'll stay that night We'll, we'll 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 work all the way through or we'll, we'll stay that night we'll let them kind of get asleep a we'll recover in the same location and then once we've done our recovery session we'll travel that evening mm -hmm. do you know what I mean and we'll travel the next day and, yeah. and, and then be back in our, our home beds or hotel or whatever yeah it no, it's really day, so. interesting and I think it's just one of the many variables you're yeah, dealing yeah, with yeah, yeah. but I think that's a good lead now to maybe look at the transition into the Ireland setup so so um, what was the what was how did you end up getting into the Ireland setup from leaving the UK to come back across? When when did that sort of happen for you? Uh, I ended up going in with Stephen at the under twenty ones. Um, I, th I think. Did you leave a club in England to come straight over, or were you? Uh, I was at MK Dons and I left. I, I actually wanted to move home. Yeah. Um, my my kids Sophie and Sean are of an age now where they're going to school. Or yeah. they were then you know getting kind of getting into school. So you know. Uh, my wife Beth is actually from Cornwall, but she wanted to always live in um, in Ireland. Cool, you know, yeah. We um, she always wanted to be here, yeah. you know. But so it was a case of at some stage we needed to get back, and that was kind of got through skill late skill so time. Just just before we jump to the Irish thing, so like because it's a, it, like this is a huge. This is not a job, in my opinion. This is a vocation. Yeah. 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 So like there, that must be tough when you have two young kids at home as well, like because you're. I said on the bus to Hartlepool or Carlisle or wherever and I've gone and back like it must like it's, it's a full on thing you know like you say like it's yeah. I'd say like how did you find that like did the did, did, uh, was it the kids that came along the major reassess things and go like right this is what this um, is big, well obviously Ireland is a big job yeah, anyway it yeah, probably yeah. would have took it yeah. either way but did that does that affect things as you because uh, like, we yeah, call this bulletproof dad yeah, the podcast and yeah. a lot of us struggle with this sort of thing of no and absolutely it's brilliant it's the number one thing of yeah. uh, all the way through but like Going back to that conversation I said with my mate in the canteen in second year of school, like the number one job, my job, the only job I wanted was to go and work for Ireland. Yeah. Like, you know what I mean? It was the only thing I wanted to do. Um, I was a Liverpool fan. I kind of wanted to do that. Was probably secondary, but definitely it was um, it was to work for Ireland. Do you know what I mean? Or to be able to walk out and what was down Lansdowne Road, you know, be the yeah, Like exactly. that's the only thing you yeah. wanted to do was do this job yeah, for them. So um, no, so and you know definitely when we had the kids it made it more difficult because you're traveling all the time and all the rest so yeah it does make life tough and then you're getting back at you know two o'clock three o'clock in the morning sometimes and you know that's going off to work and the kids are up at six and you're yeah, yeah. To, but then you've got to go in and do recovery and all the rest yeah. and it's a seven day a week job as well you mm -hmm. know so um it definitely does make it it does make it tougher absolutely but you know you've you know the the um, I suppose the flip side of it is it's a it's a great job and it's a nice it's a good it's a good um, uh, you know kids can kind of come and get involved you know certainly some of the clubs we're at later on it's very much family orientated cool, they yeah. come watch the games you know come down yeah. after the games you know and everything else and you know it's about about making it kind of a, keeping everybody involved and yeah. invested into it and you know which they were and you know they're they're all sports mad anyway so that, that helps. definitely helps <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah well there's probably they probably have no choice in one yeah, degree yeah, as well. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I know that that that's just it's an interesting point because it, it's a big thing we talk about in the podcast a lot. It's like the way I kind of summarize it is you're trying to be a provider dad going out doing what you're doing here, but then also trying to be a present dad as well. Mm. And too often kind of conflict against each other and trying to find that balance is very tough for a lot of us. Yeah. Uh, yeah. particularly when you're doing the sort of work you're doing there. And you definitely like, cannot do it without the support. Like if you haven't like you know, if you haven't got the support behind you uh, um of your wife and kids, it yeah. just doesn't happen. Like yeah, there's yeah, no it's way not an option, it would, yeah. no way it would happen. Yeah. But look, that was just great to, to. I know we went a little bit off script there, but I think that was just good to touch on. So you got how did the the, the kind of link with Stephen Kenny come across? Uh, did you so got a relationship built up with him through club no, football? Not, or? not really. No, um, 
kind of um, most of the clubs I've been at, we'd come here for pre-season. We always used to come to Ireland for pre-season. Yeah. You know, my belief at the Was time. Was that your influence? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. We used to actually train in the AUL. We'd stay in uh, the White Sands Hotel or in the, or in the, the country club. Boosting yeah. the Port Marnock economy. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> something like that. Yeah. No, no, it was very much around, like, this is the environment they need to be yeah. in. You know, this is the environment we're going to play in. Um, there's definitely loads of, loads of benefits going to hot, warm weather climates, but, you know, sometimes the, um, the, the, the accommodations you need to make for weather and everything else yeah, didn't make it. It's, it's summertime as well, yeah. so the weather's half decent here. And particularly in that sort of, um, uh, that time of the year, you know, you're kind of doing three sessions a day, mm. um, you know, and trying to get as much out of it as possible can. And we just needed, you know, some familiarity as well. So um, it was a perfect place. And, you know, All the facilities are there, to be fair. Like they are, yeah, they are. Like, yeah. like, again, I, I played with Malahoy growing up and I, my re- memory is always uh, bunking off school to go down to watch the, the team play because they, they trained in Malahoy at the time. And I think they all stayed in the Port Marnock hotel like because yeah. they did so much and again you said the AUL's on your throat as well like there's great facilities there yeah. for them yeah but we used to yeah so we used to use that and we used to use um, you know we'd have the MU gym or whatever yeah. else down there so you know it was perfect we could use it all it was kind of essentially what we'd done back then was kind of do what the old international team used to do or what they used to yeah. stay Port Marnock use a, use a pitch you know, use a nice beach and walks well. and stuff to relax yeah, yeah. Like but it's our, a nice place our, to be actually our pre-season for most of them was half seven in the morning we'd be on the beach doing a session mm-hmm. so it'd be that was a that was a, a, a key part of the, the of, of this huge, decision yeah. was like you know it might have only been a jog it might have even just been up in head tennis and kind of metabolically kickstarting the lads in the morning you know and getting them going and then we'd be eleven o'clock on the grass and be four o'clock in the gym whatever it was you know it was um, that would be our kind of general structure of a preseason day so we needed to be somewhere that could accommodate that and what better place sort of thing yeah. so um, yeah so that's what that's and I always used to bring the teams here but then we'd always run kind of like. We used to work in blocks of three days, you know, three blocks of three days of uh, of um, preseason training, uh, and then we lead into the games program and we play kind of um, three Irish teams or whatever. Um, I know we um, um, one team we used to play. Um, Michael Mugan was the manager of St James's Gate at the time, was a, a friend, and he was a mutual friend. And essentially, then what happened was when he um, when I was deciding I wanted to come home to Ireland. Uh, he introduced me to Stephen. Um, Stephen was managing Dundalk at the time and um, then had just moved into the under-21s just at the same time. Yeah. So that's where the introduction came. Because realistically, there's very, like the, the amount of opportunities in professional football in England versus Ireland, it, it, it's it's very stark contrast. Like they're very few and far between. Yeah. Like, and I imagine that the budgets of the Irish teams are nowhere near the budgets you'd be dealing with in the UK side of things as well. I know, so. I, I, no, I think it, I was just lucky that I had... At that stage, I think a twenty years experience. Yeah, and I suppose yeah. it's probably not that many stands, people here. It's not luck though; it's earned. You know, at the end of the year, and you look there. Timing fair, worked like, out. Yeah. It is luck. You know, yeah. it's definitely timings worked out, and everyone worked out. It was my right, the right time for me to move home. Yeah. It's always what we wanted to do. I always wanted to be in Ireland as well. So, you know, kind of, um, you know, having a mutual friend who introduced us at the time yeah. and um, getting to know each other then, and then he, or sorry, then him getting into the, the um, under twenty ones job, and then you know. Um, he invited me to come and interview for it and that's how it started. Cool. And like the discussion there, like it, just to kind of get an idea, are you kind of going in and you're giving your plans and your thoughts of what you would like to do and how you kind of see this? Because obviously we might talk about this, the, the difference of an international setup versus like the club is pretty yeah. much day in, day out, whereas obviously yeah. the international, it's at camps at certain times of the year. Um, like how did that look when you're coming in first? Are you kind of coming and saying, this is what I would do. This is what I'd like to do. Is that what that conversation is like? Because yeah. it's, it's, it's not a standard yeah. interview, I'd imagine. Like, But it, it, it doesn't matter if it's Ireland or it's even it's going to club or in, in, with a new manager or yeah. new coach and staff, new whatever it is. It's all about how do we how can we amalgamate all the ideas and get the best out of it. It's still it's still about it's still that same goal. It's still about trying to maximise performance. It still comes down to the lads at the same at the end of the day, the, uh, down to the players, and about how can we best prepare them and get everything involved for them. So it's a case of like, look, this is how I could see it. You know, this is how I think we could move the physical element of this forward, and how we can monitor, how we can structure um, camps, how we structure um, whatever it is. And that's the same you do in any sort of club environment. You'd be like, look, this would be the periodization structure I'd probably use around this, that, and all the rest, um, and the pr- level of preparation. These would be my ideas around, you know what we probably need to do to build team culture and everything else in terms of like um, we we have like things like working rooms and stuff like that where the lads will have where all the medical team the performance staff will all be in there um, and we'll also have some you know it's a social room as well for the lads so we can build a bit of camaraderie yeah. in there and all the rest of the other. so you bring all them ideas and you everybody brings their ideas and mix them in together and then you come up with your kind of uh, you come up with the with, with the plan moving forward and how you're going to implement it Um yeah, so it was a case of kind of sitting down and kind of going, this would be the, this is how I see the, the role, I suppose, this is how I see the job moving forward. 
Um, and you know, then taking his advice and kind of going, yeah, not that bit, yes, that bit, yeah, all that, yeah. agree with all that, you know, we tweaked it and, yeah. and moved it on and moved it forward. Because it, like, it is really interesting because like, say this role as the technology and the science evolves so much so quickly mm. that the role probably itself has to evolve with it and the stuff you're yeah. using and your outlook, it like, it, you know, like say, say you go into a club and you're replacing some guy who had the job before you, like your methods could be very different to his and it does not, like, it's not like the guy did anything wrong. It's just that the technology when he first came in has evolved big time since like, so I'd say it's, and I'd say you're probably heavily dependent on like the actual manager as well needs to have probably has to put a big leap of faith in you as well because again at the end of the day managers are coming from the football and the coaching side of things they wouldn't necessarily have much of a knowledge on this yeah. as well so there must be a huge well i think the probably, trust must be massive yeah, yeah i think probably that's where the experience comes into play like you know particularly in an international setup um you know you're getting you're getting lads coming from i don't know like maybe 23 lads coming from 20 different football yeah, clubs yeah. all training different different ways, periodization yeah. so forget the tactical side of it obviously which is a big part of it but from a physical point of it, all on different different um, periodization structures all having different preparation strategies all have different recovery strategies so it's trying to amalgamate all that into one and i think you know probably 20 years i've been in the uk and working with clubs you get to see an awful lot of different things mm -hmm. and so it was a case of right how best to integrate the lads into one strategy and bring them together and try and get that kind of you know some of the parts is obviously better greater than the all the individuals put together and it was trying to like make that make that real in terms of a physical preparation or performance preparation um so it's it was about trying to i suppose using that experience to bring them together and being able to say right well this is what we need to do with lads this is what this is i think probably the most appropriate approach and then learning what all the clubs were doing and what lads were doing with their clubs and trying to bring them into it you know some lads how, are, how do you get that information are you talking to the, the yeah you're like um, counterparts in the, yeah, uh, yeah. the clubs yeah definitely yeah that's uh, that's always happening and again um you know uh, the likes of andrew as you mentioned before uh, uh, andrew morrissey he'd have a great relationship with him too in terms of the um, uh, um passing over of information and, and stats so you know we could look at that and we can you know speak to our counterparts and you know any any individuals the easiest ones to manage are the ones who are playing all the time because it's obvious it's very obvious what their structure yeah, is as we yeah. said earlier on it's play recover play recover play recover so that's easy easy to get to know and then lads who maybe aren't getting as much match exposure etc you have to focus in on them then a lot more individually and kind of go and make contact with them lads and making sure that they're kind of you know they are where they need to be they're hitting the numbers that they need to hit um you know they're hitting their volume in terms of their total distance they're getting enough high speed runs exposure they're actually hitting sprints you know that they're so their um their acute chronic load is is right when it comes into and by that i mean like you're they're their capability is, is is as good as their readiness to perform. So they're, you know, they're capable of actually still playing in the game, mm. even if they're not playing for the club Get sort you, of thing. Yeah. So the training is adequate enough to to get them prepared. So yeah, it was, um, it's definitely a huge part of that is communicating back to the club. Can you have an, it like, where did, can you, just, where does your influence start to say there's a player who's maybe not playing with the club at the moment and they're an important player for the Irish team and you, you know that they're, they're probably going to start if they're fit. Like you need them to be, like your priority is maybe slightly different to the club priority in the sense you're trying to have them match ready maybe to an extent whereas they're not playing as much so they mightn't be as high a priority in the club because they're obviously not playing um can how does that communication happen where you're can you are you do you only get to influence their training and their what they're doing when they arrive into camp or can you have that discussion with or does it depend on your counterpart it, how much yeah, they are yeah, as no, well? it, all, it all depends on it all depends on who what club they're at and where yeah. they're at like you got to remember these lads are look, being looked after by top, top, top yeah. individuals. So it's not like they're being neglected in the main, in the main. That you very, very rarely come across a situation where lads are being neglected in any way. They're at, you know, top Premier League Championship clubs or wherever it is they're at. They're being looked after. You know what I mean? Now we just have access to the information to be able to see that. We can absolutely help in terms of to the individual. Always like one of the kind of remits when we came in to do this was we'd like to offer the lads another resource because they'll always be Irish players you know? yeah. they'll always be Irish they might move from clubs but we could have con some consistency and continuity with us so we would always know where they've come from and, you know, where they're going and not so much but when they get there we'll be able to kind of offer a little bit of continuity so um, you definitely it's like a um, we can help the lads and help them out and if we do see a discrepancy or hole in their training or preparation or whatever we mean like you know I'm careful here or you know mm. you might think about this or you just speak to the speak to the clubs directly you know and 
you know, over over that many time in any industry, you get to know everybody in such a small tiny small, industry. You yeah, get to yeah. know each other, you yeah. know. So we'd know most of our, our counterparts and whatever club they're at. So we'd be able to just pick up the phone and say, hey, how was you getting it on? And you'd have a chat through it. And like, he's been doing these sessions, these sessions and these sessions. Manager just wants him available for these games or whatever and blah, blah, blah. blah. So, you know, it's, or, or there might be elements of, look, he's not played in these many games. He's going to play in a, in a reserve game to top up his minutes yeah. and get him ready and, you know, make sure that, because they have the same problem. You know, they've got the same thing. They're doing the, exactly the same thing. They need that player. The hardest players to, to probably look after, I suppose, are the ones who are, um, are the ones who aren't playing. Yeah. You know, the ones who are, you know, even the ones outside of the, or, or pretty on the, so on the bench, but not getting games or whatever it is. So we all have the same problems. It's, mm. that's just well, generic you, you across football. You want the match ready on the day. Yeah. 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 But you if something color. happens to, the, the person in their position they've got to be ready to just jump yeah, yeah. in there at the drop of a hat so yeah. it reflects badly on anybody if that person isn't ready you know, yeah, or, I get you, yeah. my counterpart in yeah. their clubs it reflects badly on them if they're not ready to come in because that is their job so. but it, it, it's a great way of putting it because it, it, like, it really does show you how how different the context is really isn't it like that's a huge you wouldn't have to really worry about that too much when you're in the club because you're with these guys every day they're essentially your players but like that it, it probably feels from me from my opinion looking at it like you're borrowing their players for for the international to an extent for want of a probably a better phrase um so like that that communication and that 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 uh like that probably takes up a lot of your time i would imagine like it's, yeah. it's yeah. a lot of planning with that you know yeah. trying to just a lot of assessing to try and figure out where everybody's at whereas like when you're in the club it's a day-to-day -day, you kind of know where everybody's at because you're seeing them every day whereas like there's a lot of prep work i'm sure in there so when the guys come you have to do a lot of kind of background research just to see where everybody's at would that be fair yeah absolutely yeah i mean the majority of the time like away from camp is spent kind of doing that sort of stuff mm -hmm. and just keeping in touch with the lads and keeping in touch with know, getting some numbers sent back and seeing some of the objective numbers that they're doing, but then trying to reflect on that because the numbers don't always tell you the, the you know, the the true kind of um, the true reflection of what they're doing in training. So it's just understanding exactly what there is, and then any other supplementary training on top of you know just the training session. So it's about always trying to understand what it is they're doing. Um, and as I say, usually the lads who are playing, you don't even need to worry about them. You mm -hmm. can just leave them be because you know they're getting their big exposures you know, three times a week or whatever, and you know the rest of the time they're only recovering or doing what they need to do. You know, the rest of the lads, and you say a little bit more closer contact with it and be able to have a little bit more uh, conversations around so you do know exactly where what, what sort of player you're going to get when they when they, when they they come into camp or whatever it is. Um, so, yeah, as I say, getting the, getting the numbers back, getting the, 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 the stuff through, um, through that stats boards and the GPS that you get, the information back, you'll be able to get a really reasonable picture of where the lads are at. You don't actually get to see them then performing. You obviously, you can watch the games back that they do play, but if they're not playing in games, you probably won't get to see that. Yeah. So you don't. It's that sharpness, and then you know, and then and it's trying to assess as soon as they get there where are they in terms of sharpness and readiness and match readiness to to be able to get into that. You know, all elements of their all elements of their fitness follow the same kind of theory of acute and chronic loading and, and how close they are to it. Be that volume, be that speed exposure, or whatever, you could almost apply the same principle all the way through and. Even just playing in games, it'd be the same thing. You know, how, how ready are they to play in a game? You know, forget all the other metrics. They might have hit all the metrics, but have not blended them all together in a game. You know, how are they going to be in terms of skill execution, yeah, yeah. et cetera, like It's, et cetera, it's, it's probably a hard thing to, as a conditioning coach, to account for how, how, how players' first touches, you know, if they haven't played for a few yeah. games, while they're hitting all the targets. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's obviously huge, you know. Yeah. But it's a, well, it's not, like, you know, we, you'd spend an awful lot of time in terms of, like, we can hit the metrics, you know, we could send them out to a pitch and get, you know, which we would do in off-seasons and stuff like that and give them... You always give players, you know, be it club or internationally, give them off-season programmes so that the volume is there, the metres are there. But then you've got to make really, I suppose that we've gone back we've gone back to the early days, it was all about, you know, trying to drop some kilograms off the lads and get the body fats down and everything else. That was like back After in the early days. Holidays, yeah. yeah. These days, it's just about functionalising the fitness that they've maintained, yeah. you know. It's just about taking them from, Right, they've still they've still done the distances. They've still done the high speed exposure. They've still done all the met, the, the things we need them to do. Change the direction. You know, everything is done in the background off season. Now it's just functionalizing that. You know, it's very much evolved from back in them days of like, oh, right, God, he's you know he's six percent higher in his body fat than when he left. Nowadays, it's just about functionalizing them and taking them from. You know, that's where they that's where they left, and now we just need to get back to that. Volume is still the same. You know, they've still hit all the numbers. But we need to functionalize that. And then like looking at things like, can they still perform at the back end when fatigued? You know, can this can the skill execution still happen at the back end of a session, you know, as at the start of a session? Whereas obviously before they left at the end of the season or you know, before they got injured, whatever it was, they'd have no problems with that. Whereas, you know, now we're just coming back into training. It's about honing them, honing that down and just making sure they can 
not only can they do the distance, they can do it, you know, intermittently with high speed runs. They can do it with sprints in there. They can do it with skills involved. They can do it in a game based environment. They can do it in training. They can still touch the ball. They can still, you know, everything else is there. And that's kind of where, that's really where performances come in now. And it's not just strength and conditioning. It's not just sports science. It's about performance. And it's been able to make sure that, and it's not our job, obviously, for the technical or tactical side of the game. It's just about them being physically capable and ready to be able to, you know, do them. It's things. a brilliant summary, I have to yeah. say. It really puts it together. <laughs> With regards then, what does that coach or the the coaching team now in Ireland, how does that look? Because we spoke with the coaching team about the club. So like how does... Who are you, who would you be working with there? Like in terms of like, is it, I'm sure there's a doctor, there's a physio similar yeah. to the club. Is there because there's a lot going on there? You know. Yeah, no, yeah. absolutely. And we we're lucky. We have a brilliant uh, uh, MDT, like brilliant multidisciplinary team. We have um, uh, like obviously we've got on the performance side we've got myself and uh, Andrew, a sports scientist, and then we have Brendan Egan as our uh, nutritionist who's coming with us. And uh, then we've got a medical team as well. So we'd have uh, uh, Dr. Sean Carmody, and then we'd have. Our physio and athletic therapists, we'd have uh, yeah, Danny Miller, uh, Colin O'Neill, Sam Rice, uh, and Kevin Holland. You know, so we've got you know we've got a big, big, I say big team. We've got a good team there. You know, and lads have all got different skill sets as well. You know, we're kind of making sure we can cover off everything with the lads, um, and you know that team plays a huge part in terms of, or all of us, a huge part in terms of preparing the lads and getting them ready. You know, it's all about trying to get them, making sure that they're available and in the best possible condition we can get them to on match day you know yeah. that's that's essentially the role you know if you broke it down we can we can glorify it and call it all and put all big words against it but that's really just yeah, so get them all, all yeah. get them all capable ready and in the best possible condition we can on match day that's you know, always your bottom line it. no matter what yeah yeah, yeah. no matter yeah. what it is you know and all aspects of it you know all the lads will play huge parts in in the preparation of this, you know, the atmosphere around the place, you know, lads spend most of their time in that working room. They spend most of the time around them individuals, you know, and, yeah. and, and extended individuals, you know, as I said earlier on, there's always a time where, there's always a time where one area, one department or whatever is more important, you know, where it'd be, you know, the, me, the medical team. Depending the, where you're yeah, at. Yeah, depending where you're at in the, in the, we, in the day, matches, whatever, yeah. whatever it is. Like, mm. So it's all about, you know, getting, maximizing the work that you can possibly do with them, but also, you know, creating an environment and helping create an environment and a team environment yeah, around yeah. a bit of crack and, you know, exactly. people enjoy being be there. It's huge, yeah. It's an easy job to do if people are enjoying exactly, it, no matter yeah. what you're doing. So and are you actually, like, in terms of the camp, are you all there in the hotel, staying there the whole time? Or yeah. any, like, yeah. match there, you out on the pitch? Like, you, you'd be out, you're running the warm-ups on the pitch, are you? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Stuff so like that. Like, everybody's involved in yeah. all parts, you know. Again, like, it's a good example. Warm-up might be a point where it's like, okay, I, this is my bit to do, but the lads will support me in terms of, if there's any individuals that need anything or, you know, or any, you know, even down to simple things like, you know, making sure there's, the drinks are available or whatever it is. So, you know, we're all supporting each other at different times, you know what I mean? Whatever, whatever it might be or, you know, away from the game, if it's training and there's, you know, a lad going through rehab who we need to check to make sure we can get into the training the next day. Andrew might be going with uh, one of the one of the therapists and making sure that, you know, this player is numbered, hitting the numbers and mm -hmm. coming across. So we all work together all the time and it's, you know, it's, um, you know, as a as a group, it works really, really well. Um, uh, and I think, you know, we've, we've all kind of know that we're trying to offer this kind of resource to the lads um, and make sure that they're, you know, it's, they're prepared as best they possibly can. Yeah. Um, no matter it's, what it is. It's a good, you made a great point there. Like, again, for a lot of these players, Ireland is nearly the one consistent thing they're nearly, they could be guaranteed to an extent because like that the, we see it all the time now the clubs the players are changing so much and I think like there's there's a, there's there's new leagues popping up now with big money and stuff and yeah. there's a lot of merry-go-round at the moment where, as we're recording this we're in the middle of the, the transfer window so you see yeah, it all yeah. the time so it is it is a great opportunity to try and give the guys a bit of uh, consistency and continuity there it's because I said there's not there's very few uh, one club men at the moment now there's they're, they're uh, few yeah. far between yeah yeah no I think look I, I think you know as a as a resource you know we've got um, uh, Dr. Sean Carmody would like stay in touch with all the lads in terms yeah. of any sort of injuries or whatever so he's on top of he'd always be on top of that with the lad with the other therapist as well so. would the opposite happen we obviously spoke a lot about you and your team communicating with the clubs but could the opposite potentially happen say if a if a club is maybe looking at a player or like looking for information, can they go to you guys to the internationals yeah. as well for the information for the, the data? The yeah, stats absolutely. If they want? Yeah. yeah, yeah. I mean, we obviously we've centralised all our, we've got all our data saved and whatever. So if they did want something, it's available. You know, yeah. it's um, you know, it, it's although it's a uber competitive kind of uh, uh, um, uh, industry, you know, there's still an element of you know you do want the best for all the individuals in, within it. Um, people very, very rarely come across obstacles of people sharing information when it comes to things like physical data and stuff like yeah. that. 
technical and tactical stuff is obviously completely different. But when it comes to um, um, uh, stuff like that, you know, it is quite a almost an unwritten rule. But you know, everybody does it. You know, we all share information. We're all trying no, to fine. help each other out. Yeah. It's hard enough to get here, so you know, you just got to help each other yeah. out as much it's as you a, possibly can. It's a great insight into kind of the the behind the scenes of kind of what goes on in the football world. Obviously, mm. we kind of I, I remember when we had uh, Tomas Connolly here, the referee again. It was just a really good perspective of the game. We all love them. Spend so much time watching, you know. But again, there's so much stuff going on. You don't even realize the behind the scenes stuff. You know, I think that's provide like it's a fascinating insight yeah. so one thing that's kind of pressing on my mind we, we spoke about a lot there um is we spoke about like it, it all comes down to performance on the pitch on the day um i particularly i'd imagine it was probably more you're probably more vulnerable to it when you're when you're involved in the club setup back in the day because you're playing with the players all the time so say like would it have happened maybe in the air we spoke with the earlier stages you had to get your head around the fact that like different players maybe have more buy into others in the in the conditioning side of stuff would it have happened at any stage because it seems like your career path generally there was it, it just went one direction you know like i'm sure there was some big yeah, things yeah, yeah, on the yeah. way like it's football at the end of the day yeah. but in general there was seems to be a, a constant curve of, of an upper trend which is brilliant um but say like in the hard time say if you're involved particularly club, i mentioned club here because you know often to be club games or clubs maybe struggle with a performance and then it's like, oh, these lads aren't fit, or like, you know, like you're potentially one of the the outs that someone can go to if if the players aren't performing. And particularly in the club side of things, I'd say you've much more of a, a responsibility there because you're essentially a charge of the fitness of the players because you're seeing them every single day. Like, was that a, would that have come across at any stage? Or would it have been hard for you to kind of deal with, um, especially in your early years when you're trying to like, you know, you're putting your heart. I said because as I said, I've used the phrase already, if there's a lot of emotional attachment with this, you're putting your heart and soul into this every single day. Particularly if you go back to that, the early days you're talking about, there's just the three of you guys, you're going around watching games, yeah. you're planning stuff, like you're yeah. all in on that, like, you know. And then like the end of the day, you're part of your performance isn't actually being assessed on the pitch because no, or on the training ground because people aren't seeing that. People are only seeing what's on the pitch. And like, again, you're reliant on players physically performing, which might be able to perform for other areas that have nothing mm. to do with you, you know. Yeah, is well, that a hard thing to take? Maybe no, not really. Like yeah. you, no, no, it's like you know, it, criticism is part of it yeah. all. You know what I mean? Like and 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 no matter like the, at this sort of level, and that sort of level of high performance, the only thing you ever do is critically analyze yourself yeah. or and critically analyze yourselves as a team. Like we'll debrief on everything we do, and the debrief will we won't be going. That was brilliant. That was brilliant. That, that should have been better. That should have been better. That should. So we'll all know. We will yeah. know any elements of it because we don't get it. You won't get better unless you do it. Unless you take that approach. You know, pats on the backs get you only so far, but exactly, like you know, yeah. like actually reacting to anything that goes wrong, and you know, making sure that it doesn't have any error, or, or so you know, no, it doesn't, it doesn't, um, it's not hard to take sort of thing. Um, you know, I suppose if you go back to the earlier days, um, it was only the three of us. That, it was all of us doing it, and mm. even now, it still is. It's still a combined approach. You know what I mean? It's all of us as a as a performance staff kind of come together in terms of the physical element of it, and. You know, we'll put set out a plan. We'll we'll all agree on it. Going to go into camp or going in pre camp, whatever it is. We think right. This is the best way forward. You know, if it's injury led, it'll come from the the doctor and the therapist. They'll make the them if it's performance led, it'll come from us. And we'll we'll amalgamate that kind of plan and program and put it together and give the best best one we possibly can. It it still then comes down to you know, our job is really to give the lads the capabilities of doing things. And they you know very rarely would uh, never will you allow, allow a player go out into the pitch. Unless he's capable of doing things yeah. and being, and performing, so it won't happen. Um, you know, yeah, that's that's the that's the lads' jobs. Like they know that, that if there's any fear or even not capable of doing X, Y, and Z, he won't be on the pitch. It's too yeah. high a standard to be able to get there. So it's just about then the lads then delivering it and trying to get you know use what use the tools that they have, I suppose, and and get it out there. So. Um, Probably hasn't completely answered your question, but yeah, you know, it's no, it does. Like again, it's context specific, and I think where I'm coming from, like I'll use my own example here. Like I could have guys in the gym. We put a lot of focus and structure into our gym sessions, making sure they're getting the right work. Uh, but a lot of their success of the gym program is dictated in maybe a weight loss if that was their goal. Mm -hmm. And a lot of their weight loss comes down to their nutrition. And unfortunately, I can't be around the guys 24-7. So you're dependent on the guys to make good decisions on their food and their alcohol and everything else like yeah, that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And like, again, you could be doing the best stuff in the gym. But the reality is I am dependent on the people that are training with me to then take personal responsibility on yeah, certain yeah. things to do outside. Yeah, you know? so, yeah. And for me, I kind of struggle with that. That's where, where the first few years, I kind of struggled a lot with that, trying to accept the fact that 
I can only do so much. Like this is my essentially all I can control here. I can control this yeah. and the stuff I can't control. Like you just have to kind of make peace yeah. and accept. But I think I think in a in a broad element of performance, everything anything to do with anybody's performance, no matter what it is, is down to the individual. It comes down to the individual. We're there as a support structure to put the things in place to kind of offer you right. This is the best way forward for you to get from here to there. Um, and but it absolutely comes down to the individual. You know, I think you know you look at any modern day kind of performance diagram and it's kind of split between split between 25% of it probably being tactical and technical 25% of it being physical and the other 50% made up of psychological and social so yeah. it really comes down to the, huge, to yeah. the person yeah. it's always down to the person and there's so many like amazing podcasts out there that, like, that will come down to it. it's all about people but this certainly in terms of performance comes down to the individual you know none of us can meet, even in our environment where we're living together 24-7 and all the rest if you're hotel room closes and you're doing the wrong things we don't know like you know yeah. I mean it's like if you're not sleeping if you're not you know whatever it is you know it comes down to the individual that you know we can guide you and we can monitor things as best as possible you know we can monitor everything from you know we've got whoops and aura rings and stuff like that and lads we can see their sleep we can see their recovery we can see their outputs so we can guide them and you know keep them on the path as best we possibly can but it absolutely comes down to in any in any type of level of performance it comes down to the individual and how much they are kind of willing to give to it, how much dedication they're going to give to it, um, how much buy-in they're, 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 they are into it. And then, you know, I suppose, then trying to get the team to do that in the same direction at the same time. Yeah, no, it's fascinating. I said, I really enjoy speaking with people, particularly from the coaching element, because I think it's great talking to a player and they can talk about their personal standards and everything else. But it's one thing having your own personal standards, but when your performance and your success is judged on basically other people performing, I just think it takes everything to a whole other level. It really <laughs> yeah, does. Yeah, yeah. But look, Damien, yeah. this has been a fascinating, fascinating conversation. I really appreciate your time here today. I think anybody listening to this, whether they're a football fan, a sports fan, or into their, 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 kind of, their science or their physical activity stuff, will take a lot of value from that today. So listen, thanks so much for your time, Damien. No problem at all. Cheers.